If you're an average player, you want to be left alone, all right, because you want to be able to slide by. If you're a good player, you want to be coached. If you're a great player, you want the coach to tell you the truth every day. Did I hustle on that play? Did I make the right read? Did I play the guy with the right leverage? You want to know every play, because you know why? They want to be perfect. Everybody here makes a choice to do one of those three things. Welcome to the GOAT Consulting Podcast, a podcast dedicated to people striving to be a GOAT, the greatest of all time, serving it up in a way that you can get it in all stages of life. Hey, I'm Colby Jubinville, and welcome to another episode of the GOAT Consulting Podcast right here in studio in VC Productions in Nashville, Tennessee. We've got a great show for you today, a, another part to the conversation with Randy Huth, and we're excited about that. Uh, we're excited about we Oh, yeah, about his story and about continuing to tell that story in Nolansville and Shanghai and Vol State and, and success at all levels. To the left, as always, is my good friend. He's the LinkedIn whisperer, the calming force to our show today, John Byers. John, thank you. And that's not Tyler. That's Randy, Randy Huth, part two of the Randy Huth episode. I think we're going to title this thing, what did we say? Smell the roses, blow out the candles. Smell the roses and, and blow out the candles. We are the GOAT Consulting Podcast. We're going to serve it up in a way that you can get it. In our 20s, they teach us to get in a game. In our 30s, we move up in the game. In our 40s, we try to stay in the game because those 30-year-olds are so damn good. In our 50s, what the research says is we ask ourselves, what is it that I really want? Those 12-year-olds were asking what they wanted for sure, and we're going to get into that conversation a little more, the, the darlings of ESPN. But we are the GOAT, the GOAT Consulting Podcast. GOATs are easy to see in sports. Sports, like those little leaguers in sports, they're recognized for their greatness. They elevate the play of those around them. In business, it's people that compete on unique perspective, unique education, and unique experience. And what they do gives them energy, giving other people energy, creating new levels of challenge and new levels of opportunity. And Randy, as you move from high school into Vol State and into the Shanghai Beavers, it's certainly new challenges along the way. What would you say is the greatest difference between high school and college and then international league for mm. you? What what did you what did you learn along the way that you can say on our show? Oh well. <laughs> uh, well, you know, the competition gets better every yeah. every level. Yeah. You know, uh, when high school, you have you know teams are top heavy. You got a, a few good guys, and then it tails off a lot as you get uh, higher levels. You realize that everybody's good. Yeah, you know there aren't any players just filling a hole anymore. Now everybody can play. Yeah, you know, and that's the biggest difference. But you know, when you're talking about playing internationally or going overseas, there's a whole lot of difference over there. Yeah, you know, everything from the food to the entertainment to yeah. You know, the fans, everything, it's, it's a lot different. Is that something that you knew early on that you wanted to do, was try to continue to play at a higher level? No. I actually, um, I was done playing baseball, and I was and I was just going to coach. And then I got a call one day that said, uh, that was from my old college roommate. His name's Clay, and uh, he, Clay Roop. And he was playing in China, and he said, uh, hey, is your passport still good? And I said, <laughs> yeah, why? And he said, well, we just won the internet. We just won the China the t- tournament and now we're going on to the international tournament where they play all of the southeast we need arms these these southeast asian countries all play against each other and he said and our one of, one of our pitchers a lefty he, he tore his hamstring and we go to the international tournament in two weeks uh and can you come and i said well, where where do i need to go he said bangkok thailand <laughs> wow so, and i was like awesome. that sounds cool yeah I, had, I hadn't picked up baseball or anything in a while but yeah i'll be there and uh, two weeks later, I was I was in Thailand. And the the crazy part about that is I got there. It's 24-hour travel. You know, it's the exact opposite end of the yeah, world. Yeah. And, and so I got there at 2 in the morning. I knew that the game we played that day, and I thought it would be at night, so I'd have the daytime to sleep and rest. No, we played at 8 in the morning. And so I got there at 2 in the morning, traveling 24 hours. Mm. And then I thought, well, okay. So I guess at least I probably won't pitch the first game Uh so I'll be able to rest, and then I'll get tonight to sleep, and then I'll be fine. And then we get on the bus at 6.30 in the morning, and it's the first time I've seen Clay and all that. And he's like, you're pitching today. <laughs> this is going to be awesome. You know, so. Uh, For who? Yeah, yeah. So needless to say, that first game didn't go so well. Uh, and uh, I, I wish I could take that one back. But, yeah, I pitched terrible. It's a long bus ride to play a baseball game so, right there. Yeah. Let's talk about some stats because baseball is a game of stats. And many, you know, it, we just are known for 
uh, piling every, measuring every single thing. But there are some really impressive stats around what you've been able to be a part of and to help lead and produce for uh, for Nolansville and this team, certainly the last couple of years, but as you've been coaching the last 21, um, how many total – you you wrote this letter to the, the city of Nolansville the other day. I read that. It was super cool. You you talk about there's 4,000 – 6,500. So 6,500. Go ahead. Little Keep leagues, is that, that what you're yes. talking about? There's 6,500 little leagues in the United States. So to make it to the World Series, you have to be in the top 10. Top 10. Yeah, and the year before you had to be in the top eight. So they, they expanded the field to 10 this year. So you have to, of those 6,500, you have to be in the top 10, which I don't know what the percentage wise it is, but that's. Only 21 coaches have gone twice back to back years back-to-back. like you have. And let's talk about the top four teams of in the, on, on the planet, as I would say, in the universe that, that Nolansville is a part of. You've got. Uh, Williamstead, Curacao, 159,000 population. Honolulu, Hawaii, 347,000 population. Taipei City, Taiwan, 2.6 million in population. Mm. And Nolensville, Tennessee, with 15,000 population. <laughs> I mean, that's incredible. I mean, everything is stacked against you in all of these stats. Sure, and those numbers are a little skewed. You know, our, our boundaries actually go into Franklin and Brentwood, so you can add some numbers to that, but still – we're still not even close to the other ones. Um, uh, so, you know, Honolulu, they're a great team. Um, Gerald, he does an, uh, an awesome job with that team. He's actually won yeah. the whole thing twice. He yeah. won In 2018, he won it, and then he came back this year and won it. And, uh, you know, he's a great coach, and that, that team is really good. But, they, you know, they do have a, a larger population to choose from. Mm. You know, it's not that they're cheating. Everybody's like, they're cheating. and They're not cheating. They're, they're following the rules. But they do have a larger population to choose from, right. whereas, you know, much bigger than us. If I had all of Nashville to choose from, um, I could probably pick 13 kids that could go compete against with anybody in the universe. But Why do we uh, default to when we get beat or, or when we run up against somebody that's really good? Why do we, uh, not all of us, but sometimes we'll default, oh, they must be cheating. Yeah. Georgia. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, but you know that Hawaii team didn't cheat at all. They they follow the rules. They do what they're supposed to do, and they're just that good. You know, so um, but yeah, those numbers are crazy when you think about it. We we do have a much smaller population. When you think of us playing against uh, Chinese Taipei, and they have two million people in their boundaries to choose from. It's wild. I mean, that's crazy. You, you know, I'm sure you could pick 13 kids out of there that can play. Yeah. You know, like it's uh, it's it is crazy. Educate our audience about um, how entrenched baseball is in in that. Uh, culture, you know, for them to come and, and continue to play at a high level. Taipei and, and you know, it, the, you always see them. Oh, yeah. yeah. In, in that, at that level. Yeah, I mean, the what, teams what, from Korea, Japan, yeah, yeah. The Chinese Taipei, which is Taiwan. So yeah, if, you, if sure. you watched in the in the late 70s, early 80s, that was. They That's were called, all you saw. They were Taiwan. Same, yeah. same team, Chinese yeah. Taipei. Uh, and they actually go by both names, and I asked them which one was correct, and they're both correct. Mm. It depends on who you're talking to. So that's the same place. Um, but to you know that baseball is a big deal for them. Yeah, you know, on all on a social level, on a political level, it is a big deal to those countries, and they take it very serious. Uh, and this was the first year ever that Japan went zero and two that they lost their first two games. They've never done that before. Uh, they usually have a really good team, and they lost their first two games this year. And um, but you know, you can definitely tell how disciplined and how good those teams are when you watch them practice. You see those teams practice, it's a whole different level. It's so strict, so one way. They Corey only group. do it one yeah. way, you yeah. know, and, and those teams are really good. And then you see a team like Curacao, who is all over the map. You know, they live in, when you're in Williamsport, you live in what's called the Grove, and uh, that there's dormitories, and nobody can get in the dormitories. Their, their yeah. security keeps, you're, it's on lock and key, you got to buzz through. Only players and coaches, parents don't even get to see these, these dorms. But in, in our building was us, um, the, the team from Iowa, the Mexico team, which, you know, they speak Spanish, and then the team from Curacao, which speaks Dutch. Mm. So we're all in one building, and, and everybody's having to communicate with each other. Wow. It's re- a really That's cool super thing. Cool. But you see a team like Curacao, they're all over the place. These kids, are wi- they're wild. They're having a good time. Their practices are <laughs> yeah. not – it's not regimented at all. Yeah. But look what they finished. Well, you know? it reminds me of, of one of the conversations we had with Jesse Cole and the Savannah Bananas, right? Yeah. I mean, in his league, they won the championship three out of six years. And and ultimately he said or we said or somehow we came to the conclusion, like those two things aren't mutually exclusive, right? Yeah. You cannot – you 
you don't have to just be a fun team or a team that wins, right? And it it reminds me of when we closed out our last part of the conversation, we talked about um, your experience on the mound. One of the things that you became known for was uh, bringing this calming force. And as a part of that, the, the saying, smell the roses, blow out the candles <laughs> – we talked about, so I want you to, to speak about that, but it's, I also want you, it's really good. because what it makes me think of is, as we ran out this last part of the conversation, was around this moment for me with Miyagi and Daniel from Karate Kid, and it reminded me that confidence comes from community and experience. And uh, on the flip side, you know, we can always lose, we can also lose confidence from community and experience. And it seems like the, the energy that you bring to the team and to the tournament that you became known for, that, that people love to talk about you, that I love to watch. This is a very long setup for this question. I've, I realize that because I also have a kid that's played travel baseball for 10 years and had coaches that are the opposite of that. Can you talk about that calming force that you bring. Talk about smell the roses, blow out the candles, and the, the success that that has um, that we can all see very easily, but but even more importantly with the team, your team. Yeah, it's, you know, when you want to get the best out of somebody, uh, first you got to get them to stop and understand what you're even telling them to do. You know, they can't do it if they, if they just don't calm down enough to even understand you. So my thing has always been let's slow the game down. Slow the game down. Let ourselves catch up take a deep breath and to get a 12 year old to take a deep breath is sometimes hard. So I use the saying, smell the roses, blow out the candles. So they'd smell the roses, breathe in, blow the candles, breathe out. And that happened, you know, they, they mic, they put a mic on you when you're coaching in the region all the way through the, the Williamsport. And I went to the mound and Jack Rhodes was on the mound. He's a kid who played for me for two years. Um, He was on both teams. And uh, I just was trying to get him to calm down, and, and he, he knows. what. I, and so if you watch that clip, I had no idea that, you know, that they were filming right. and that they were keeping the audio and all. But so I, I went out to the mountain, and I was just like, hey, you got to calm down. Let's smell the roses, blow out the candles. Do it again. Smell the roses, blow out the candles. And then um, after the game, I look at my phone, and I had just <laughs> hundreds of messages, and that yeah. – ESPN and Little League both took that clip, put it on TikTok, put it on social media before the game was over. Had a mil- had already had a million it. views, mm. and I didn't even know it. So I had no idea what that I had even said it. You know, and when we got off there, it, was, it had blown up and gone viral, and it was pretty crazy to see. Um, but that's kind of what I've been known for, uh, not just that saying, but my calming presence. You know, when I go out to the mound, I, if I'm crazy, if I'm, yeah, you know, if I'm not calm well how can i expect them to be they're 12 thinking back through your experience is there is there one moment in time where you know that you said hey when i have somebody in this moment and i want to bring calm to them composure to them i need to say this what do you know do you remember where this idea came from yeah my, you know my, my dad used to always tell me to, hey you gotta slow the game down yeah you gotta slow the game the games it's a you know you gotta the game can move very fast so it, it comes from that yeah, it comes from that. It's just, hey, we've got to slow this thing down and and let ourselves catch up. I love it. Otherwise, you get you get a little crazy. You, How does that apply to business and relationships? Oh, I mean, I think in, it's especially in relationships, you, if you can't stay calm and have a conversation, I mean, if you immediately blow up or mm. go off the rails, you know, makes for some tough conversations. If you stay calm, the other person's going to be calm too. It's very hard to yell at somebody who's being calm, right? Yeah. Somebody's being very calm. You can't scream and holler at them. You can't have a, you, you can have a regular conversation with somebody being calm, but you can't really have a heated argument with somebody that's staying calm. It's teaching self control, which is part of emotional intelligence. Yeah, yeah. And if you get a kid to calm, especially twelve, you know, take 10, 11, 12, 13 years old kids, you get them to calm down, and then you tell them what they need to do. All right, here's what you're doing wrong. That's what that conversation was with Jack Rhodes. Their he, ability to hear you in that moment. Yes. Now he can hear yeah. me. He's looking at me. He's calmed down, and now he's listening. And, and if, now you can tell him what he's doing wrong, and he can fix it. It's the speed of love. Correct. Correct. You know, and and that's always my thing. Always, even when we were in the World Series and it was the bottom of the sixth inning, they had against the Great Lakes team. They had bases loaded. We had no outs. If they score one, you know, they're sixty feet away from one in the game, and and, mm. and we were in trouble. 
And uh, we had no outs in their bases loaded. And I went out to the mound, and I was like, guys, we practiced for this. We've gone over this. You're built for this. You know what I mean? Everybody take a deep breath. Okay, now let's go back to our position. Jack's going to – I said at the time, I said, Jack, if you throw nine strikes, you can get us out of this thing. And he he threw six strikes, struck out the first two batters, and then the third batter hit a ball, and William Satinoff, we call him Satty, he dove into the hole and caught that mm-hmm. next one. We went on to win it in extra innings. But that saved the game. Uh, and I think if I would have gone out there yelling and screaming, those kids, who knows what we would – we would have lost, I is, think. Is it a new team every year? Yeah, well, you uh, – so You got to be 12. You got to be 12. So you can be 11 and 12. By the rules, you'd be 10, 11, and 12. But uh, I always try to take at least two 11-year-olds – so that I have something to build on for the yeah. next year. So the first year I had um, William Satinoff and Jack Rhodes. They were both 11. Th- this year they were 12. You know, So y- you could see they were our two leaders. They were our number one and number two guys. And next year I'll have two returning, uh, Grayson May, the center fielder, and Nash Carter, the second baseman. Well, th- go ahead. Well, I think we got to camp on that because one of the things that's fascinating about what, you, what you've done and what you just shared about building is that you've become known for building a bench. And I feel like anybody that's listening to this that's that's raising kids or raising adults, might I say, or building a business or building a team or a relationship, you have to pay attention to the bench that you're building. Sure. Can you talk about that and like how you've – I mean, I think you just did, but can you expand on that a little bit more and then maybe how that might apply to some of the, the work that you've done? And Sure. I mean, when you're talking about building a bench, that means that you got to have guys that can come in at any time – and do the role that the person in front of them is doing. And that's not always easy. You think of substitutes in any sport, and you think the subs are worse sure. than the starters. Mm. Well, that's that, that's not necessarily true. Uh, and, and the goal is to make it where that's not true, where if somebody gets out for an injury or for whatever reason, the next person goes in, you don't lose a beat. you know. And that's always my goal is to have kids that know their role. They know that they might not be – in the starting nine, but they know I'm still going to go in the game. And when I do, I have to, I have to play just as well as the guys that were playing ahead of me. And that's what you're talking about when you're building a bench, which goes um, in, in, in everyday life. You know, you got when one boss moves on, retires, quits, fired, whatever, you got to have somebody that can step in and replace him and the, and the place not miss a beat. And that's what building a bench is. You got to train all those other guys to be ready for the spotlight when it comes. There's a certain um, – we'll hop around a little bit here because I think this all kind of plays together as we continue to talk or I continue to think about this calming force and energy that you bring to this conversation today and, and uh, clearly out on the field. There's part of that that's natural, and it's how you grew up, right? You've talked about your dad. Part of that that, that comes naturally to you, but there's also part of that that you have to – I make up, you have to pay a lot of attention to. Sure. How do you do that? Because I will tell you, I'm really good at whatever the opposite of that is. <laughs> like, when I think about, I mean, not 100% of the time, but most of the time, and even when I'm ta- trying to, to parent love my kids, I can sometimes get wrapped up into their spiral, right? And I totally. Or jump into it or cause it, right? Sure. And I don't want to put that all on them because it's me. But, but I will tell you, I mean, you've... And I, how do you pay attention to that, and how do you intentionally grow in that area? I think it helps that I do not have a kid out there. You know, most little league coaches are a dad. You know, a dad is coaching, and mm. one of the dads is coaching. You know, and that's where you, you get a lot of negativity, but that's not a bad thing. I mean, the dad's giving up his time and volunteering to be a coach. Um, you, you get the terms daddy ball, that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, I don't have a kid out there. So everybody knows I'm there for one reason. I'm there, you know, of course, yes, you want to win and all that stuff, but I'm there to, to mold young men. Uh, and and people can see that, you know, because of the way that I coach. But uh, it helps. I don't get super emotional about – because I, they're not my kid. You know, it would be yeah. real easy for me to get angry and upset with a kid with if he was my kid and I knew what his potential was or what I wanted his potential to be, but I don't have that. I have the, They're all my kids, you know, so it's the same for me. Uh, but the first thing is that you got to practice what you preach. So if I'm not, if, if I can't calm myself before I go out there, mm. how am I going to calm them? So when I'm talking about smelling the roses, blood comes, I'm doing the same thing. Sure, I'm doing the exact same thing to keep me calm. Yeah, to go out there and then be calm for them. You played Hawaii twice. Unfortunately, I mean, arguably one of the best teams of all time. Of all time, and you had to play them twice. And 
you certainly showed a tremendous amount of improvement between that game one and two, which we could have a whole conversation about that. And sure. It's worthy of having it. There's also, I'm, I imagine, there's some kind of um, how do you balance uh, optimism, belief, you were built for this, some of the words that you've talked about, and reality of, you know, what you're going out to face. I mean, a giant of a team, right? Like, how do you, what, what did that conversation look like before the game? Yeah, so you, you just got to be honest with the kids. That, that's a good team. That's a really good team, and I don't know if they are beatable. Mm. I don't. I'm not going to lie and say those guys are beatable because I don't know that, and I haven't seen that. But I told the boys, "Hey, I don't know if they're beatable or not, but if they are, why not us? Mm. Why not? Why don't we be? I think the, I heard you say that. Why don't we game, be yeah. the team? Why don't we be the team that yeah. beats them? You know, and if the pressure is on them, the pressure is not on us. They've already beat us. They beat us so bad. They beat us in three and a half innings, thirteen and nothing. Mm. You know, they made us look terrible. Uh, so we have nothing to lose. The pressure's on them. Let's go out and have fun. Let's play as hard as we can. And if they're beatable, why not us? It's good stuff. Why not us? One of the one of the ways that we honor our guests is we'll dive into this segment that really comes from the movie Jerry Maguire. I'm sure you've seen that. One of the greatest. And at the beginning of the movie, he writes a mission statement. It's not a memo. He wants to make that very clear. It's a mission statement. And it's called The Things We Think and Do Not Say. The Future of Our Business. Yes. And um, we, what comes to mind for you, Randy, when we bring that topic up? Things that we're not supposed to quote-unquote talk about. What are those, what's one of those things for you? Well, offhand, this has absolutely nothing to do with the future of our business. However, <laughs> uh, things that we think and do not say is, man, there's a lot of questionable uh, umpiring behind the plate. I don't know if you watch. If you watch it on TV, there was, there's a ton of pitches that are so far outside that are hard for – you can't tell a kid to swing at that because you can't teach them to swing sure. at that pitch. It's yeah. not a strike ever. Yeah, yeah. It's never a strike, and they're never going to be able to hit that. They're never going to be able to swing at that. So what do you do? You can't go out there on national TV and argue with an umpire. How bad am I going to look? You know what I mean? I'm going to get tossed out of a game in a little league game on ESPN. Mm. No way. That's never going to happen. So we're thinking it and we're talking about it behind closed doors. Like, whoo. And, and those guys are doing their best. I what do you attribute it to the training, the, the type of person that, that decides to be an ump? Um, They're volunteer. Right. You got to remember that they are volunteer. And so they know part of the rules is that you're not going to come out there and, and, and challenge them because that's not part of the culture of Little League Baseball. They don't get paid? Yeah, they're volunteers. Really? And so you, you, yeah, they're 100% volunteers. They pay their own way to get there, too. Wow. You know, but uh, hmm. you, don't argue, you can't challenge balls and strikes. You know, like and out and safe, you can go to replay. Is and this that something stuff. that's been commonly discussed among coaches? It has. It and has. so is there going to be – is there action that's going to be taken to say we, we've got to figure – got to start paying umps, we've got to – I don't know. Yeah. I don't, you know, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. Uh, you because know. certainly it does impact the business, right? Oh, I, I, I would. Well, I was going to go back, and maybe this is not what you were just referring to, but but you let off this part of the con- your answer with, I'm not sure how this maybe applies or impacts the business. This is this is in business conversations all day long, right. right? I mean, one of the things I talk to my kids about, and my wife and I don't fully agree on this concept. She's also a middle child. Um, <laughs> is that we? Does it, now I don't say we anymore. I say I. I don't do fair. I don't do yeah, fair. Yeah, like yeah. one day you're going to get the yeah, ice cream and, right. and the candy and the next day you're you not. not like yeah. your, your brother. That's just the way it is. But that's what you're talking about, right? Like there are life, even though you can create teams and cultures and family and where I know you talked about being fair <laughs> is, is really critical and that's the idea. But when we step out into reality, sometimes it's just not there. What it's is, not. what is the rationale of, of having, um, volunteers for umps when every other aspect of what they do is professional, right? I mean, it's, it's top, it's top tier. Sure. Well, little league is built on volunteers. You know, our coaches, we're all volunteers. Okay. You know, we all pay our own way and uh, the umpires, the staff that they have that works concessions, all that's all. So volunteers. it's just part of their DNA. It's a, it's a core it's piece to who core, they are as an organization. hundred percent. And interesting. Uh, and, you, and I'm not trying to get crazy off topic of what I think the, the whole entire purpose of that question was, but yeah. that's just the first thing that came to mind when you no, said things that you don't say. Well, it's a problem that needs to be addressed, right? Because you, what you said was, what I heard you say was, how do you teach a kid to swing at a ball that's so far? It's still a ball. It's the, never a strike. Yeah. It's not like you can't tell a kid, hey, you're going to have to swing at that. 
Because that's never a strike. Yeah. You know, but th- that's going to happen. I think that's what I'm trying to, at least for me, what I'm connecting with here is that's going to happen the rest of your life. So how do you do mm. and have that conversation with them, which as a coach to say, that, and, and maybe you don't have to make all those applications, right? But that's going to happen in business, in school, in life. I mean, those things gotcha. are going to occur, and you've got to figure out how to deal with them. Do the kids reference that to you? Do the kids? Oh, yeah. We, we talk about it. The, you do. From the very beginning, I tell them, look. It's not going to. The umpire is most likely every at bat you're going to get one strike called on you that you do not agree with. Okay. Go ahead and accept it. Yeah. So it's a you're, teachable moment. You're going to get one. Yeah. That means you better hit the other two. Gotcha. You know, that means you're going to get two shots. You're not going to get three because one's not going to go your way. We say the umpire always gets one, and I, we teach that from day one. Now, mm. there are at-bats where <laughs> right. the umpire got three. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I was like, oh, my. Like, Jack Rhodes got hosed on, a, on a, an at-bat where he didn't even get thrown a strike. And I was like, oh, my Jeez. goodness. He's our best hitter, and they're doing that to him? Yeah. yeah. You know, and it, and it goes for both teams. So, it's yeah. the other team's thinking the exact same thing. You know, we're both in the same boat. So, it's – so, on a – on a playing level, yeah, it's fair because it's equally bad. Gotcha. Uh, <laughs> I, I want before we we have this last part where we're going to ask you to pull your phone out here. I want to tell you, from a dad to a dad, having four kids, three boys, one that's played travel ball for ten years. The lessons that I learned in watching you and how you behaved, and I hope. Many of the coaches that my older son has had was watching that as well and humble enough to, to garner lessons in their own coaching. Like it was it was so meaningful Thank to you. me. Thank and you. and I appreciate your approach, your calm. I mean, it just was I, I can't thank you enough. Thank you. Well, so pre- it was super cool. I appreciate that. You know, I got messages from all over the world. People were sending me messages like, hey, I love the way he coached. It makes me reevaluate the way I'm doing it, the way rethinking it. And it's not that my way is better than any other way, but when you're – they're kids. Well, you know it, I mean? it is – it could certainly be better than other ways for sure because I've experienced the other. So thank you for the good work that you're doing. And it, and it has a residual impact that you will never even realize, and that's super cool. That's true. So pull your phone out. One of the last things we're going to do before we shut this down well, is – Well, and he has his book title too. He does. Smell the Roses. That's right. Blow out the candles. Lessons learned. I need a shirt. from Randy Hurth as a little league baseball coach. I mean, this is a New York Times bestseller that's from Nolansville. It's my mission statement. I love it. So it's we're great. Gonna, we're yes, gonna, that's it. it. He tied it all together. We're gonna pull one more oh, layer guy. off the the Randy Hooth onion here, and we're gonna ask you to share with us your top five songs. And we're gonna we we prepped a little bit before this because uh, it's random. And it's your repeat songs on Spotify since that your that's your platform. What are those five songs? God, but, you know the music I listen to is so obscure. This like, is great. You know, this is like, why it's so I like special. the I like to call you know my playlist on on Spotify is called Sad Bastard. So like that's kind of the <laughs> kind of music I listen to. So it's all. I don't even know what that means. It's all just sad. <laughs> I music. think we're about to learn. Oh, yeah. Okay, sad so, music. Uh, okay. You know, um, I guess number number one is Wanted by One Republic. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Two is All Along the Watchtower by the Four Strangers, which is a cover from Sons of Anarchy. Love it. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. Fool's Gold by Fitz and the Tantrums. And Legendary by Welshley Arms. Okay. And Keep It Loose, Keep It Tight by Amos Lee. Mm. Mm-hmm. So what do those five songs say about you? That I'm not a very happy person, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're all well. You're you're middle aged. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I, I think they're all calming tunes. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, you know, awesome. I, I will say this: they, there's zero hype behind any of those songs. So, well, hey, is there is no there lon- is there loneliness in in coaching and at that at that for sure? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, you feel it, that? It's oh, it's you know, it's a lot of pressure, and especially when you're on the stage like that. Mm. Yeah, man. Everybody wants to question every single move that you make, you know? Yeah. Well, and I think what's so fascinating is that, and that we, we don't need to miss this part, but, but your team won the sportsmanship award. And I think it came out in something that you said earlier when you were talking about smell the roses, blow the candles. You're like, I didn't know anybody, anybody else was filming that. That's character. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Like what you do when nobody else is watching, listening, we've all heard that definition, right? That's why that made sense to me. And yeah. so, again, I think more to to that point. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Super, super cool to have you here. We appreciate you taking the time to be here. Yeah, and, and I love more it. Than, more than that, we appreciate the the commitment that you make to not only the game but to to the, to the kids that you serve. Thank you so and, much. The world's uh, better off. Love the story for sure. For Tyler, who's on the road, and for John Byers and our good friend Randy Huth and all the volunteers, even the umpires out there in the world. Uh, this, this, I'm Colby Jubenville, and this is the Go Consulting Podcast. Oh.